So thank you, Archon. Um, that's Archon Fung, who is a professor at the Kennedy School um, and one of the people who tried to organize many people around the ideas of the Coffee Party and the, moti uh, the, the motivation of the Coffee Party. And I'm very happy to welcome him to the law school to participate in this event. So everyone in this room, I think, and most Americans across the country recognize we're in the middle of a crisis. And one astonishingly good thing about this crisis is that it has inspired the production of citizens. It's inspired the recognition of citizenship as a public office. The recognition that all of us, as citizens, have a public duty, a public responsibility to take responsibility for the government and for the society around us. Now, I am an extraordinary admirer of what the Coffee Party has done in exemplifying this idea of citizenship as a public office, of bringing together an extraordinary range and diversity of people, political diversity and uh, cultural diversity committed to a single idea of civility in advancing understandings about what we should do to address the crises that is the current focus of our democracy. It's different, this movement. This movement uh, in particular and brands of the Tea Party movement are different from what we've seen in politics before because these are movements without candidates. These are politics ticks without the politician at the center, and an inspiration for what a democracy could be. Now, the question I think we should be asking is where to go with this movement. What is the right, as in the correct, set of reforms that we should be focusing on? What is the problem here to be solved? My focus, my belief, is that the most important problem here is that we need to focus on the right issue and ignore the distractions. And the right issue, in my view, the only issue facing American democracy today, in my view, is that we have a democracy that is stalled. It is stalled for the left and for the right. This simple mess mechanism of democracy, the idea that you vote, and if you win, you get what you voted for. This simple mechanism has been broken in American democracy. It's broken for the left and broken for the right. Why? What has broken it? Well, I think we should start by recognizing the conception of democracy that the framers of our democracy gave us. Their conception of democracy that was that we would build a government that at its core had a certain kind of dependency. That dependency was the idea of a Congress dependent upon the people. And by dependent, that meant a Congress that was fearful and focused on what the people wanted and not concerned about what the executive wanted or what courts wanted or what foreign princes would want it. And this right form of dependency is what they meant by Independence. Independence was focusing on the right kind of relationship. And for our government, it was to be for the people. And so the question we should be asking is, is our Congress dependent upon the people? Well, technically, of course, it is. Technically, every two years, Congress comes up for a vote. After the 17th Amendment, every six years, every senator comes up for re-election. So technically, voting controls, and technically it's still just natural persons, no corporations yet, who get to vote. But the question is effectively, meaningfully, is our Congress dependent upon the people? Well, consider these two things. We could call them thing one and thing two. On the one hand, with thing one, there's this practice that was born here in Massachusetts, the practice of the gerrymander. Here it is, the first gerrymander. But the practice of architecting districts increasingly in our tradition to produce what we call safe seats, seats where 
Members of Congress are pretty much assured re-election if they seek re-election because the seat has been crafted to make it so no opposition would have any realistic shot in overturning you. So here's a seat of the United States Congress. Here's a seat of the United States Congress. Here's a seat of the United States Congress. You might think, don't districts have to be connected? But fear not. This is connected by Route 294. So if you want to go door to door from Stone Park to Cicero, you just have to go down the side of Route 294 to get to the other part of the district. Now, this practice of building safe seats has been a success for the objective Congress had in doing it. There is one thing our Congress is very good at. It is in assuring its own re-election with an almost perfect rate now, better than any of my students in this class uh, or in this building. Um, they achieve the objective of making sure that if they want to return to Congress, they can come back. That's thing one, a Congress that is safe in the sense that members are confident they can return if they want to return. But on the other hand is thing two, which is even though seats are more safe, Congress is more competitive. Since 1994, when the Republicans showed the Democrats that they could oust them, there has been an extraordinary competition, a fight for control over the leadership in Congress. And a competition then get, gets manifest in this practice of fundraising. As they raise an ever-increasing amount of money to make sure that they can get back to Congress, they or their party to get back to Congress as they fight over the 10 to 25 seats that are actually in contest. Increasingly, the first job of a member of Congress to be a congressman becomes the second job of a member of Congress. And their first job is the job of fundraising. They have become the fundraising Congress. Now, it's important to recognize how new this phenomenon is. There's a great book by Robert Kaiser, So Damn Much Money, which describes the rise in this phenomenon through the industry of lobbying. And as he describes it, we should understand this now as a certain kind of economy. The economy has three parts. There are lobbyists, there are members, and there are the interests interested in getting lobbyists to talk to members about them. Each of these pays the other. Each of them depends upon the other. So lobbyists pay members. During and after their tenure in Congress, lobbyists pay members. They pay them during their time in Congress with cash. And not cash in a brown paper bag. I'm not talking about bribery. But cash in the sense of the support for campaigns that members increasingly feel they must raise to bring their party back into power. Members spend between 30 and 70% of their time raising money to get back to Congress. These members thus become dependent upon these lobbyists as suppliers of the campaign cash they need. And to push the metaphor just a bit, pushers of the campaign cash that they need. This is new. As Kaiser describes it, money has been part of American politics forever on occasion in the Gilded Age or the Harding administration, for example, much more blatantly than recently. But the scale of it has gotten way out of hand. The money may have come in brown paper bags in earlier eras, but the politicians needed and took much less of it than they take through more formal channels today. So compare, for example, this man, Senator Max Baucus, senator from Montana, man who represents 0.3% of the American population, but arguably the most important man in the United States Senate affecting health care legislation. While he was the most important man in the United States Senate, he gladly opened up his campaign coffers to whatever contributions those he was regulating wanted to make, and they deposited more than $4 million in contributions to his campaign to get the pleasure of his attention to their particular view about health care legislation. Compare him with this man, John Stennis, senator from Mississippi, no choir boy, John Stennis. But when he was head of the Armed Services Committee in the early 1980s, he was asked by a fellow congressman to hold a fundraiser for Defense Department contractors, the very people he was regulated. Stennis's response was, would that be proper? I hold life and death over these companies. I don't think it would be proper for me to take money 
from them. So the point is that Kaiser has is that the ethic that Stennis reveals, an ethic alive even as late as the early 1980s, is completely gone from Washington today. Even the recognition of the idea that you should restrain yourself in trying to raise money from the very people you are trying to recognize or regulate is not even recognized in the context of Washington today. So that's during their tenure. And then after their tenure, lobbyists pay members with their futures. Congress has become, as my friend Jim Cooper from Tennessee puts it, a farm league for K Street. Increasingly, members and staffers and bureaucrats have a common business model, a business model focused on their life after government, their life as lobbyists. So Public Citizen estimates between 1998 and 2004, 50% of senators left the Senate to become lobbyists, 42% of members of the House. So that everybody in this hill depends upon this system surviving, and so the system survives. This is the sense in which the lobbyists pay the members. And then the members pay the interests through policy that gets changed, sometimes profitably. So the University of Kansas had this study about lobbying for the change in the American Jobs Creation Act. They found the return on investment from lobbying to amend the statute was 22,000%. Or this recent study in the American Journal of Political Science calculates the return of large firms lobbying to get tax policies changed, and they calculated for every $1 spent, they could lower their taxes between $6 and $20 because the effect of the influence of their lobbying. So sometimes profitably, sometimes brazenly. The New York Times had this story in the beginning of February about Chuck Schumer going to Wall Street to try to raise money from Wall Street to get back to Congress and to support the Democrats getting back in power. But the Times reported that the city's titans of finance uh, accused him of being insufficiently pro-Wall Street. One indignant fellow stood up and demanded his donation back. Now, remember, this is Chuck Schumer. There is no member of the United States Senate more responsible for turning over complete deregulation to Wall Street than Chuck Schumer. But this man is insufficiently pro-Wall Street. And that attitude of Wall Street has a predictable effect on our policymakers. So here's a story just in the New York Times, beginning of April, of the top 10 hedge fund manu uh, uh, managers who earned, on average, last year, $2.5 billion, B, billion dollars. That was their salary last year, OK? What do they pay in taxes? on that salary? Well, because of a loophole in how hedge fund are calculated, they pay capital gains rate on those that income, 15% tax rate. Now, Obama wanted that changed. He wanted them to pay the ordinary tax that you and I pay on our income, on their $2.5 billion in income. But Congress said no, because too many in Congress were fearful that if they took away that extraordinary benefit of that low tax rate to these people making $2.5 billion on average, they would punish the members of Congress by not giving them the money they need to get back into office. So in this way, the members pay the interest. And then the interest pay the lobbyists, as Kaiser puts it. In earlier generations, enterprising young men came to Washington looking for power and political adventure often with ambitions to save or reform the country or the world. But in the last fourth of the 20th century, such aspirations were supplanted with, by another familiar American yearning to get rich. So this industry, which is the size of the American recording industry, has produced such people as Gerald Cassidy, who invented the way that earmarks are now used in our economy of influence inside of lobbyist systems. He has amassed more than $100 million in personal wealth from the lobbying industry. And as that industry becomes wealthy, Washington becomes more wealthy. Washington is now among the richest counties surrounding Washington anywhere in the nation, because it turns out that the business of selling policy is an enormously profitable business. So the point is these three things work together as an economy, 
an economy that produces a kind of dependency, a kind of dependency which is not the dependency our framers imagined of Congress upon the people, but a dependency of Congress upon the funders. That is the fundraising Congress. Now my view is this fundraising Congress is first bad for America. There's a common view, especially on Fox and MSNBC, that America is a polarized place. That we have people on the far right and people on the far left and very few people in the center. And in fact, that is a true description of the politically active people in America today. The people who turn out to vote, who contribute money, who are obsessed with Fox News and MSNBC, those people are polarized. But those people are a tiny percentage of the American population. And on the major issues that people think about when they think about politics, America is not a polarized nation. America is, in fact, very much in the center of these two extremes. And the extremes alienate most Americans. Most Americans stay at home, don't want to have anything to do with politics because of this extremism. Well, the thing is to see how the fundraising Congress actually makes this worse. Because the fundraisers tell the candidates they need to push their message to the extreme to raise the most money. And because we have safe seats, that was thing one, congressmen can afford to push the message to the extreme because there's nobody in their district who's going to beat them. If they're on the right, they can be far right and nobody on the left can beat them. If they're on the left, they can be the far left and nobody on the right can beat them. And what that does, that dynamic produces more alienation because the politics becomes more extreme. The way we fund elections helps cause the problem everybody here is so concerned to address. The Fundraising Congress is also, in my view, bad for democracy. Democracy is supposed to mean one thing. When the winner wins, the winner gets to change things in the way the winner campaigned for. So when the left wins, we're supposed to get the change that we want. When the right wins, they're supposed to get the change that they want. But the Fundraising Congress defeats this. The Fundraising Congress is the status quo Congress. It's a Congress which protects the status quo because the Congress is dependent upon the status quo funders. So think, for example, about the story of financial services, which I think is the most important political story for America to understand because in this story is everything pathological in our political system. And you can understand it in an extraordinarily powerful way through this book just out by Simon Johnson and James Clack called 13 Bankers. So they tell a story. It can, one part of it can be summarized something like this. There was a depression. It was very bad. In response to that depression, Franklin Delano Roosevelt decided to create a system of regulation that had a simple principle at its core. The principle was oversight, at least where financial instruments were involved, oversight. Every major instrument of the financial system, from bonds to stocks to savings, would be supervised, some say regulated, by the system of public regulation, a system that required that these instruments be public, transparent, and that anti-fraud requirements be built into how they are issued and policed. In the 1990s, Geniuses, some of them here at Harvard University, had an idea for an amazing innovation. It was called deregulation of these financial instruments. And so a whole new swath of instruments were invented. You've heard them, derivatives, CBOs, all these instruments creating new financial uh, instruments to be traded and sold that were private, that were not public, they were not transparent, and indeed even Alan Greenspan supported that there not even be an anti-fraud requirement built into their regulation. Now for most of the time that this change was happening, nobody, literally nobody, had a clue about how significant this under-the-table market of financial instruments was, because it wasn't public. Nobody could even add it up. It wasn't even on balance sheets. This was completely invisible to regulators 
and even to people in banks and financial services industries that were supposed to be affected by them. But we now can begin to estimate something about it. So Frank Portoy gave me these estimates. He said, if you look at 1980, probably 90% of the financial instruments in America were subject to this regulatory regime of publicity, transparency, and anti-fraud requirements. In 2008, 90% of the financial instruments in our economy were outside of that regulatory regime, not subject to publicity requirements, not subject to transparency requirements, not subject to anti-fraud requirements. 90% of the financial instruments in our economy. And obviously, in a condition like that, it creates the incentives for a bubble. And that bubble is exactly what we saw burst in 2008. Now, it was the financial services industry that pushed Congress to allow this system of unregulated, deregulated instruments to develop. But that wasn't enough for Wall Street. Deregulation wasn't enough for them. There was a certain kind of re-regulation that Wall Street insisted upon here. Wall Street insisted that there be a government guarantee when these bubbles would burst. They wanted a bailout. They wanted a signal from the regulators, the Fed and from Treasury, that when this blew up, as of course it was going to blow up, everybody knew these things blow up at some point, they would be covered. They would continue to be able to make their $2.5 billion in salary after the collapse happens. And they got that guarantee. They got that guarantee from the Fed and from the Treasury to signal to them that they could play their gamble and not worry about the consequences producing what Krugman has referred to again and again as a system that socialized risk but privatized benefit. People talk about how we've got to get rid of socialism. I'm with them. We've got to get rid of this kind of socialism, this kind of socialism where a few benefit and we pay. If we're going to have socialism, let's flip it around. <laughs> but this is the socialism we have in America today. The socialism that allows the 2.5 billion earners to not suffer from the system they built and that blew up and brought millions of Americans to their financial needs. Now, anybody looking at this system would conclude it's, it's an insanely stupid system of regulation. Why did we get there? Well, one point Quack and Johnson put right at the center is the fact that as the regulators deregulated, there was an extraordinary rise in campaign contributions from exactly these industries. These industries increased their contributions faster than any other industry in America. So policy was bent to the status quo. Now there's a whole new set of optimists out there, people who say, oh, but what about health care? Doesn't health care show that Barack has changed Washington? Don't we now know that we can achieve what we want because he's found the magic bullet to get the regulation we need? Ezra Klein, a brilliant analyst who I agree with 99% of the time, wrote this extraordinary piece called The Twilight of the Interest Groups, where he said the Obama administration succeeded at neutralizing every single industry. Now, I wish that were true. But I agree with Glenn Greenwald in his response to Ezra's piece. As Glenn puts it, if by neutralizing, Ezra means bribing and accommodating them to such an extreme degree that they ended up affirmatively supporting a bill that lavishes them with massive benefits, then he is absolutely right. But being able to force the government to bribe and accommodate you is not a reflection of your powerlessness, quite the opposite. And to pretend that this bill represents the twilight of the interest groups, that special interests have been neutralized, is just hagiography and propaganda. The way this bill has been shaped is the ultimate expression and bolstering of how Washington has long worked, one can find reasonable excuses for why it had to be done that way, but one cannot reasonably deny that it was. Inspiring, I think, the greatest philosopher of the 20th century's words, same, same as, it ever, as it, ever it ever was. Same as it ever was. Same as it ever was. The 
the status quo stalls reforms. And they stall reform because Congress is depend upon, on the, dependent upon the status quo funding. So what do we do about this? Well, I think we need to ins be inspired by the technologies we engage with every single day of our lives. We need to think about how do we boot? You pick your operating system here, whatever you'd like. And I hope more of you are going to pick this one. We need to reboot. And in the Windows version of reboot, reboot means control, alt, delete. So first we need control, right? Who? needs to take control. Well, we need a movement, and in my view, that movement has to abide by certain fundamental principles. Number one, it needs to be a citizen movement. I'm all for good-souled politicians out there. I think they're important, and we need more of them. But that's not what this movement needs. What this movement needs is citizens, citizens who have woken up to the fact that they have a duty of citizenship which is a public office they must occupy. Number two, it needs to be cross-partisan. We need to find a way to talk that gets people to recognize that while we might not share common goals, we have a common enemy, a system that stops democracy from functioning. And three, this principle must argue for a restoration of the integrity that was born in our government with our Constitution. So what would that change be? Well, here's where we invoke the delete. We take an idea a Republican had 102 years ago, Teddy Roosevelt, for deleting the corrupting influence of money inside of politics. The idea is citizen-funded elections. And in the current version of that, what that means is that candidates for Congress voluntarily opt into a system where they accept small dollar contributions only. So for example, there's a bill in the House right now, the Larson Jones bill called the Fair Elections Now Act, which says that you can accept up to $100 from any one citizen. The government will match it four to one. So every $100 is worth $500 to you. That bill now has 142 co-sponsors in the House. And it's within a striking distance of passing the House in this, uh, this, this uh, particular year. Or there's another version, a more ambitious version, by Professors Ackerman and Ayers. It calls for Congress to create $50 democracy vouchers that every citizen gets. So the conservatives love education vouchers. We have here democracy vouchers. $50 democracy vouchers that then can be complemented with contributions, we could say, up to $100. $50 democracy vouchers to every citizen would produce $6 billion new dollars in the political system. In 2008, the total amount raised by all candidates for Congress was $1.4 billion. So this would be almost quadrupling the amount of money inside the political system, but coming from small dollar contributors only. Now the point is, either one of these systems would make it so that we know that no one could reasonably believe that the product of government's regulation was something that money had bought, so that all of us could believe, as we all desperately want to believe, that when Congress does whatever stupid thing Congress does, it's either because there's too many Republicans or too many Democrats, but certainly not because of the money. Now, how do we get to this deletion? Well, there are a couple strategies here. There's strategies that are inside the Beltway strategies and outside the Beltway strategies. Inside the Beltway strategies means legislation. And the organization that I helped found with, with Joe Trippi, Change Congress, has pushed through this site, Fix Congress First, to get people to support the Fair Elections Now Act by taking action and calling your congressperson or senator and making sure they have signed up to a co-sponsorship of this important legislation. And there are lots of steps that people are taking. And I think these are important steps to push Washington from inside the beltway to do the right thing. But Increasingly, I think we've got to address an enormously difficult question, confront an enormously difficult truth. Is this going to be enough? Can we plausibly imagine that inside the Beltway, they're going to be able to radically change the way Washington works? 
Is a conventional battle here going to be enough? Can you imagine a guy like this walking away from all the money in the world? And increasingly, my view is uh, no. That we're not going to win this inside the Beltway through traditional inside the Beltway strategies. We've got to think about what the outside the Beltway strategy looks like here. How do you build the movement that makes it impossible for them not to change the system that they have broken? This is where the alt in control, alt delete, enters. An alternative way to get government done. There are two laws of politics we have to recognize. Number one, in America, politics needs a horse race. It is a very rare breed who on a beautiful Saturday afternoon would come into a dark Harvard Law School room to talk about politics in the context of no election or no promise of any campaign victory. Most Americans can focus or think about politics only in the context of a beginning, middle, and end story where end is some kind of vote. That's point one. Point two, rebels never win using conventional means. Our forebears did not beat the British by donning red coats and standing before them on the Cambridge Common here. They found different strategies, a different technique to beat that dominant conventional force. You weren't going to build another Death Star to destroy the other Death Star. That wasn't going to win. And even Obama did not win by using conventional means. It was the internet that gave him an opportunity to raise the funds necessary to be a credible candidate in a way that would have literally been impossible six years before. We need here an unconventional strategy to beat the conventional strategy. We need an unconventional horse race too. Unconventional, and the unconventional our framers gave us is the idea of a convention. So the Constitution, Article 5, describes how the Constitution gets amended. The only way the Constitution has ever been amended since it was adopted was Congress proposing an amendment which the states then ratified. But in the Constitution, there is a second strategy to amend. It's called the convention strategy, where states call a convention for the purpose of proposing amendments to the Constitution. If 34 states call for a convention, then the convention gets convened for the purpose of proposing amendments. So we can imagine, for example, Rhode Island, Oregon, and then, of course, it would break out all across the country in this very... I did these graphics all by myself. I think I need some credit. Okay, so all across the country breaking out to, re to pull together people to say that we need a context in which we can talk about these questions of fundamental reform. Now, what's interesting about the politics of calling a convention is that it can be called for any purpose. People can be calling for a convention from Rhode Island for the purpose of changing the way elections are funded, from the, from the state of Utah for the purpose of creating a balanced budget requirement. That may be their purpose, but even though people have different purposes, it creates a convention where people have the same opportunity to talk about what change the nation needs. And so long as you get 34 to pass the resolution, that's enough to force the convention to be formed. Now, many people are terrified by the idea of a convention. They fear a runaway convention. They fear a convention that draws into question fundamental values all of us share. But we need to remember some important points about a convention. First, all that a convention does is to propose amendments. And those proposed amendments must then be ratified. And they are ratified by legislatures or state conventions, not by referenda. I spent the last nine years in California. I would never recommend any system that led to referenda decisions of anything. So I'm not talking about a system that would put our Constitution up to a popular vote. I'm talking about a system that asks serious citizens committed to thinking out how our government should be formed to focus on this question. It requires 38 states to ratify an amendment, which means 12 states, indeed one house in 12 states, is enough to stop any amendment from being part of the Constitution. And as my view is there are 12 solid red and blue states, I don't think either extreme needs to fear that they would be taken over 
by the other. Either extreme needs to recognize the only kind of change that could come through is a change that appealed to the broadest base of America's views about how to fix the system most of us think is broken. And we need to remember that even if you don't get the convention actually called, even if you don't get to 34 states, getting to close to calling for a convention itself has an important effect. Because as Washington imagines losing control, they will respond. They will reform to staunch the convention movement. And there is important precedent for this. The only time our Constitution has been changed in a way that restricted the scope or changed the contour of Congress's power was when the Senate was changed to an elected body. And the 17th Amendment, which did that change, was only proposed by Congress when it was absolutely clear the states were about to call for a convention. There was one vote short to call for a convention, which terrified Congress enough that they radically altered the structure of the way the Senate would work. That fear of a convention inspired change, or in that time the font would have looked something like that. Uh, and that same type of inspiration through fear is a technique we need to think about as well. And finally, we need to recognize that this movement is already starting. It's already been articulated by the far right. So in the Wall Street Journal just last weekend, someone who wants to see the scope of federal government power shrunk began to articulate. This is a representative from Virginia who inspired South Carolina representatives and Florida representatives after him to talk about how a convention could create the opportunity to shrink the scope of federal government power. They are beginning to push this movement strongly. And my view is that we need to be a part of that movement, too, if we're going to define it in a way that allows it to be something that could produce a consensus of how our Constitution would be changed. So we've also started Change Congress, this call a convention platform, meant to be a platform for helping to organize at the state level and a platform for debating different ideas for what changes there should be. So there are proposed amendments. You can make your comments. You can rank them. You can critique them to facilitate a dialogue that will be conducted according to the principles that we have learned from Wikipedia and from the coffee party, principles of respect and civility, to build this platform for the alternative. Control, alt, delete. That's what rebooting is about. Let me just give one more word before I end. So everybody knows this company, StrideWrite created these great shoes, which I'm sure somebody is wearing today. It was founded by a man named Arnold Hyatt. He's a shy guy, Arnold Hyatt. There's only one picture on the internet of Arnold Hyatt, and it's tiny. You can't really even see what he looks like. It's such bad resolution. But Arnold Hyatt is a very wealthy, loyal Democrat. 1996, he was the second largest contributor to the Democratic uh, elections. And that earned him the favor of Bill Clinton. When Bill Clinton invited 30 fat cats to the White House to talk about what Bill Clinton should do. We don't have any pictures of Arnold Hyatt at the White House. We don't have any pictures of him addressing the president when he stood up to tell the president what he should do. I kind of imagine it looks something like this. <laughs> But Arnold stood up and he said to the president, Mr. President, I know you're an admirer of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And I think you need to put yourself in the mind of Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1939, when Roosevelt realized he needed to convince a reluctant nation to wage a war to save democracy. America didn't understand they needed to do that. Roosevelt did. And Roosevelt spent that year to convince the nation of their obligations as citizens of a free world. And Hyatt said, Mr. President, you too must convince a reluctant nation to wage a war to save democracy. But this is not a war against Nazis. This is a war against fat cats, against all of us in this room people who use their money to control the way government works, people who thereby corrupt 
the way this democracy functions because most people believe money buys results. He gave that speech. There was silence in the room. <laughs> he later recounted in an entry about this, I came away from the evening with an empathy for a skunk at a loan party. <laughs> The only description uh, published about this was published in this book by Larry uh, Mackinson. Um, it says, Clinton's response to Hyatt effectively slashed Hyatt to pieces, humiliating him in front of the group because Clinton recognized that his 29 other big fat cats were not going to be happy by being told that they should be pushed out of the political system. So Clinton ever the appeaser quickly grabbed them and rallied them to support the system of plutocracy which we have allowed to develop. Now, I think 14 years after Hyatt took that step, we need to recognize Arnold Hyatt was right and that we all now must convince a reluctant nation to wage a war to save democracy. Now, Sarah Palin has told us we can use phrases like wage a war civilly. We can take up arms without meaning to use any guns so we can wage war and take up arms civilly. And that's what I believe we need to do. We need to act in the way Democrats with a small d act to save this democracy. Because unless we, as citizens, take up the responsibility of this citizenship, this democracy, is failing. Now, I'm more than honored to be able to ask you to join us in this, but more than eager to get you to lead us in this. Thank you very much.